British Columbia has a mountainous coastline, often inaccessible except by boat. High annual precipitation and moderate climate produce high volume tree growth. Settlements and accompanying industry have established themselves on the flat river estuaries, notably in the southwest corner of the province. From the beginning, transport of logs has been by water. Small booms of logs were towed to booming grounds for assembly and delivery to the mills. As the accessible timber near the mills was consumed, harvesting moved steadily up the coast. Tow boats traveled a maximum of 2,000 kilometers to take the logs to the mills. Active tidal systems and gale force winds whipped down the inlets, creating dangerous seas for the tow boats. Tow lines broke. Boats and crews were put at risk. To combat log losses during tow, a number of ideas were tried. One was the Davis Raft, a giant bundle boom containing many sections of logs. Industry explored the use of barges. The first barges were old ship hulls, crudely adapted for log transport. Loading and unloading was slow and awkward, but towing was safer and faster, and there was no log escapement on the way. Log escapement was a continuing problem. So early in the 1950s, forest and insurance companies formed a cooperative, Gulf Log Salvage, to recover lost logs. A number of receiving stations were set up where a licensed salvage operator could deliver recovered logs. The first self-dumping barges appeared in 1954. Logs were piled across the beam of the vessel, which was towed to the receiving grounds. To save time, onboard cranes were added in 1961, which gave the capability of delivering the logs from the woods onto the barge. However, a round trip still took seven days. The first self-propelled, self-dumping log transporter was put into service in 1975. The Haida Monarch was built by the Kingcom Navigation Company for the trip between the Queen Charlotte Islands and the Macmillan Blodell pulp mills. This self-propelled vessel has eliminated the need for a towboat. It is faster and easier to control and can make a round trip of 1,600 kilometers in only five days. Loading time is about 18 hours for 15,000 tons of logs. Unloading time about one hour. The latest self-propelled barge is the Haida Brave, built in 1978. Her load capacity is approximately 10,000 tons of logs, but the cranes are more powerful, able to lift 40-ton bundles of logs from dry land sorting berths. Loading time is about four to five hours. Log losses have been greatly reduced. Barge hauling has reduced the time that logs are in the water. Better handling, more care with containment, better boom logs and bundle booming have all lessened the escapement. In spite of this, there has been a definite increase in the number of low floating logs in the water. Logs which are a menace to navigation four factors appear to be involved. First, the increased use of bundle booms for some logs below the surface of the water for long periods of time. Second, logs dumped from self-dumping barges tend to form a huge underwater tangle which can take several days to break up. Third, use of slow growth trees from higher elevations and poorer sites. Fourth, the percentage increase in hemlock in the total forest cut, 
hemlock being the heaviest of all coastal species. 80% of the 10.5 million cubic meters of logs supplied from saltwater booming grounds is towed to mills along the Fraser River. Fresh water, being a lower density than salt water, causes the water-soaked logs to sink. In addition to heavy commercial traffic, there are thousands of pleasure craft sailing on these waters. Collisions with debris and deadheads result in substantial insurance claims each year. The 1973 figure was more than three quarters of a million dollars. This debris comes from two principal sources. One is the cumulative escapement from coastal log tow operations. The other is debris from coastal rivers. Periodically, high tides move accumulated debris from the beaches, adding to the problem. Each year, rising rivers pick up logs and debris and carry them to the sea, where they're dispersed by tidal currents. Before 1960, no accurate figures for this debris were available. Both government and industry were concerned for the economy and for the environment. So the Council of Forest Industries, with the federal and provincial governments, agreed to a joint program. The first step was to measure and evaluate the extent and range of the problems. The British Columbia Forest Service carried out a four-year measurement of debris in the Fraser River. About 40% of the debris was natural. Of the 60% man-made, half was commercial poles, logs and lumber, and half materials with sockets, such as branches and log ends. Equally notable, of the annual debris load, fully one-third from 29,000 to 85,000 cubic meters came down on the spring flood. A 1974 consultant's report for the Council of Forest Industries stated that of the debris in the lower mainland waterways, excluding merchantable timber, almost three quarters came from the Fraser River. Nearly half of this material was estimated to be suitable for chipping. These data form the basis for a number of cooperative programs. In cooperation with the Forest Service and industry, the Council of Forest Industries has constructed a shear boom designed to direct floating debris into a holding pocket of the Fraser River. This fin boom is constructed with one or more fins fastened to each boom log, which causes the entire boom to be deflected by the river current, making the sweep flexible and self-acting. The boom tested out very well. In conjunction with this fin boom, a catchment system is presently operating on the Fraser River. A number of control and collection programs are carried out by local harbor boards and patrols. Taking advantage of uncommonly high tides and strong winds, a collection of accumulated logs was made during five days in December 1975. From the beaches around Howe Sound, more than 5,000 cubic meters of solid waste was burned. The public has also been involved. The Flag a Snag scheme is jointly sponsored by the Environment, Forestry and Recreation and Conservation Ministries of the Government of British Columbia, together with the Council of Forest Industries, radio stations, and other organizations. Boaters are issued with flags, which they drive into any snag or deadhead which they encounter, making the hazard visible to other water traffic. Estimating the volumes of debris has become an important part of forest survey work in British Columbia. Using aerial photographs and maps, plus ground reconnaissance, a reliable system was developed, 
with formulae to measure the density of debris on water surfaces and shorelines. Later, the Forest Service was able to obtain digital data scan tapes from the Landsat satellite system, which provides a pass over each area every 12 days. Commensurate area analysis between satellite readouts and aerial plus ground data demonstrated high comparison reliability. New prediction equations have been developed for debris survey work, and the satellite programs appear to offer substantial savings over the helicopter and high aerial flight methods. Water transport of logs in the interior of the province brings its own problems. The velocity and destructiveness of river flows has normally prevented river drives of logs. Recovery of logs from a flood swollen river was not practical. As the water level fluctuates wildly, much of the timber hangs up along the river banks or in jams and remains until the next season's high water carries it off. Construction of very large storage lakes behind power generation dams has brought problems. These dams were constructed several at a time in less than two decades. The land area flooded was so great that between the announcement of construction and the filling of the reservoirs, it was impossible to harvest all the timber. Often, the best that could be done was to clear the foreshore of the newly forming lakes. These were generally high head dams designed to hold maximum volumes of water in storage. In only one case was provision made for waterborne log bundles to be transported from above the dam to the water course below. The dams did exercise flood control on the rivers which renewed the feasibility of water transportation. The Canadian cellulose mill at Castlegar had been licensed to cut virtually all the timber on either side of the Arrow Lakes and the Columbia River, some 320 kilometers from the mill, in order to sustain a craft pulp mill and sawmill operation. Logs harvested at a number of operating sites were delivered to the river and lakes, boomed up and towed downstream during the annual high water each May. As part of the Columbia River Treaty, the Hugh Keenley side dam was constructed in 1968. A canal lock was built into the dam to permit the passage of marine traffic, including log bundles under tow. This lock is the only one of its kind in British Columbia. Currently, project designs are being prepared for another dam on the Columbia, the Revelstoke 1880. A number of log handling options are being examined to ensure the transport of logs around the 160 meter high dam. No transport system has yet been finalized. With the Peace River system, we encountered a different situation. The rush job of pondage clearing meant that many logs had to remain on the ground to float on the rising water. The new lake meant more access to merchantable timber. This, together with the supply of timber created by clearing, secured enough wood to warrant a new sawmill complex. On the many new reservoirs, there may be winds, but there are no tides. However, seasonal drawdown can equal 20 meters. The tow boats have plenty to do, and debris removal is enormous. Burning is a practical solution for debris disposal when the nearest town is 100 kilometers away, but metropolitan areas strongly resist open burning as an acceptable disposal method. Still, we have made progress. From Davis rafts to self-dumping, self-loading, self-propelled vessels. From limited use of interior waterways to a concerned and controlled use of them. And from ground survey parties to satellite photography.
In light of these advancements, the future looks bright.